fear finds a home in you. It finds the softest spots imaginable and sets up residence. Nick Cutter, Little Heaven. Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Devin. And it's high noon. Uh, Steph has her white hat on and I'm sporting my black hat while we talk about horror westerns. This episode of Books in the Freezer is brought to you by Audible. This podcast wouldn't be possible without audiobooks. So if you want some spooky stories told by some familiar voices, try Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, read by Dexter's Michael C. Hall, or The Dead Zone, read by James Franco, or podcast favorite Joe Hill's Nosferatu, read by Kate Mulgrew. For a free audiobook and 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash books in the freezer. Happy listening. Howdy, partner. <laughs> I didn't think you were really going to do that. Or are we not doing this? Um, oh, I was not sure about the energy, like the type of energy we were bringing to the show. Is this not like how we're going to talk the whole episode? Oh, no, you, you're welcome to. It's it's okay. You know, it's all right. It's very hard to do that one sided. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take it down to a few notches. I came in real hot on that one. Just a little, just, just a tad. All right. So Westerns and horror. That is... Yeehaw! I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll, I'll, sit in. I'll sit in the corner. Now. Yeah, it's a... Uh, we've, we've tackled a lot of various blending of genres, but I feel like this one is probably one of the more absurd. Yes, definitely. And I kind of love that about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, horror western is under the umbrella of, like, the bigger weird west genre which is just like a modern not necessarily even modern but a mashup of a western with another genre but usually things like occult or cosmic or you know steampunk anything like that right and so horror western is under under that umbrella yeah and and weird west is a a pretty well-known rampant kind of niche genre with within westerns but i find uh, like comedy and horror, okay, they mix because they're they're almost opposites. They they're a good contradiction to each other, a good contrast. Um, drama that kind of fits in there because you got the the emotional uh, manipulation. Western, I know it's a thing, but I f- they are so disjointed and unconnected that it's like weird. West is certainly probably a very apt description for the genre. I find it, it's very difficult to get, you know, scares and, and being horrified when you're looking at, you know, six shooters and, and shootouts in the Wild West. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a lot of horror to be found, you know, within just even Westerns themselves, just looking at like what you were saying, the the reality of the, you know, shootouts, but also even just the isolation of the setting sometimes facing brutal conditions well no yeah that that's that's a thing like towns especially if you look at these westerns that are based in like the the turn of the century the 19th century um you have these towns that are completely cut off from each other because horseback and telegraph is their only means of communication so yeah you get the very isolated alone kind of feeling kind of a a, a very prime territory to be terrorized by some some creature or some malicious force group of outlaws coming through the town yeah are you a fan of westerns in general i'm not not a fan of westerns i I, admittedly no this is this is probably going to be the episode where i am probably at the weakest in my knowledge of the genre um i do enjoy westerns um when i have watched them but they're not something that i seek out like i've seen clint eastwood i've seen john wayne but it's not like i i need to go and, and and consume the genre so reading these books getting reintroduced to it has been quite an experience 
they they have a definite feel to them for sure yeah a very distinct feeling all of them felt very different Mm -hmm. than anything we've done prior to this episode i mean i'm by no means an expert on westerns i have not watched any of the like big classics you know no um no i know like everyone can shame me because i've really only seen like the newer true grit (laughs) The, like Clint Eastwood directed one with Haley Steinfeld and like my dad liked the Young Guns which is like from the 80s that's got Emilio Estevez in it doesn't it yes oh my it's got God. a whole, whole gang of people in it Charlie Sheen yeah Lou Diamond Phillips oh my god it's the beginning of the regulators <laughs> late 90s the pop version of westerns yeah <laughs> wow that also a book I read that I really liked was The Sun by Philip Meyer, and that has a a series on AMC with Pierce Brosnan. Ooh, okay, I didn't know that. Weirdly, very weird casting uh, as like the patriarch of a Texas oil family. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in school, it was not a horror book, but when I was in school, one of the mandatory readings that we did was Shane. That was a, a very popular Western novel and really weird movie too but but other than that that's like my main experience in the literary sense of westerns i I am clueless otherwise yeah didn't didn't read a lot of like louis (laughs) l'amour i did i have a lot of family in south dakota so i did go to deadwood on a family vacation once (laughs) so i've like supposedly like seen the chair where wild bill hickok got shot (laughs) Now, I know who Wild Bill Hickok is because Black Aces and Eights is a dead man's hand, and that comes from him. That's that, But that's more of a poker thing than a horror thing on my part. But yeah, like in terms of the setting that we've, we've already talked about, one thing, as I said, where in these stories, or at least, Dan, talking about my um, experience with Westerns in general, the... The setting, it's, you don't normally get the, the large scale, like, you know, the world is at stake kind of thing, or, you know, a global kind of situation. It's usually very close, tight knit, uh, very, very narrow scope for, for the events that are unfolding. And I think that aspect of it does translate well to horror. Yes. We do have a few books that are set in modern day, but you know, oftentimes Westerns are very much set in a certain place in time where we are dealing with the expansion of the West. So yes, even like the, the moment in time is a small scope within itself. And even geographically and a lot of the themes of western seems to translate well to horror as well oh definitely i mean you've got stuff like revenge lawlessness survival which you know i love i'm always here for you know you got those showdowns you got good versus evil us versus them the law versus the lawless the natural versus the unnatural which makes a great pairing natural you know being maybe the elements versus hello the supernatural exactly so 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 maybe my earlier assertion that they're so disjointed that it's kind of weird isn't entirely fair because again when you really look into the the backbone of their of their narratives or it's kind of similar to what you do in a horror story so maybe i'll step that back a little bit oh man so now that we've talked about what a great pair they make do you think there's any movies that blend the two? <laughs> there's certainly movies that blend the two. One is My Chilling Obsession that we'll talk about later. Oh. Still got my head scratching a little bit. Probably the first one that'll come to mind with anybody is going to be Ravenous. Uh, when that movie came out, that was everywhere. Like, not just as a horror movie. That was a highly acclaimed, very popular, very successful film that came out a couple years ago. Was it a couple years ago or was it longer? I'm like, I feel like it was a long time ago, but... <laughs> I remember it, but I don't remember the time. I'm pretty sure it was. Oh, okay. Never mind. It was 20 years ago. That's why I'm <clears> like, I don't I don't remember this at all. 20 years ago is when Ravenous came out. I am old. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, I watched Bone Tomahawk because I saw it on a lot of lists of horror westerns, but it in no way advertised itself as like a horror movie at all. You know, it's got Kurt Russell. It's got... Um, What's his face in all the Conjuring movies? Patrick Wilson? Yeah. That's him. Okay. Um, And Jack from Lost. I also can't think of his name at the moment. <laughs> no, I'm lost in that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> 
it is a pretty basic story you know like woman and like some other people like kidnapped by some violent native americans and like a, a group is getting together with the sheriff to go find them and hunt, rescue them oh i will say a fun horror fact so the movie opens up with uh david arquette and said hey like uh murdering some people and scavenging goods and looting the bodies so i thought that was like a fun little horror nod it's like david arquette from scream and you know, sid Haig from the rob zombie verse that is really cool <laughs> um uh but yeah so it doesn't other like it really doesn't market itself as a horror movie uh but then as we get closer to the end i will say it was one of the most brutal killing scenes i've ever seen in my life and uh, it stayed with me. <laughs> that killing tomahawk is very, very um, akin to a very iconic scene from Terrifier. Just, is it really? Yes, it's basically the same kill. Well, it's funny because my my parents and I share a Prime account, and don't judge me; it's my Prime account. They mooch off me. Thank you very much. Uh, and it was on our my recently watched, and my dad told me today he's like, "Oh, I started watching that movie you had on there, Bone Tomahawk with Kurt Russell," and I was like, "Ooh, yikes." <laughs> how did he like it he hasn't gotten to that part yet he watched like the first 20 minutes and he's like yeah i'll get back to it and i was like Ew, watch out for that that's gonna be a fun update next episode yep <laughs> oh god and i guess i mean the last movie we could talk about is gonna be one of my favorite franchises which is tremors that's defined as a horror western because again you have that bottle episode kind of feel where they're stuck in a valley it's basically a, a desert um and yeah you have these underground monsters devouring people left and right um the fourth in the series is actually a prequel that takes place uh in 1889 and that one is a straight up like spaghetti western kind of western horror so if you haven't seen tremors do so please <laughs> Looks around guiltily. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> that wasn't shaded stuff at all. <laughs> at least watch the first one. Okay, I think it's on HBO. Uh, also, <laughs> Kevin we didn't talk Bacon. About... I know. Bert Ward. All right. Anyway, <laughs> and we didn't talk about Near Dark, which blends oh. westerns and one of my favorite western combination vampires. Western vampires. Yes. Love. That sounds awesome. It's really good. And it was actually, well, I know you weren't the biggest fan of Mongrels, but it was a big inspiration for Stephen Graham Jones when he wrote Mongrels. I like Mongrels in a sense. Like I like the events that unfolded. I just, just something about it, there was something missing from it. But I did enjoy it. And if Near Dark kind of was loosely in, inspired it, then okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try it out. And it's got Bill Paxton. Done. Okay. I knew it. <laughs> it's queued up right now. Bill Paxton, Kevin Bacon, uh, Patrick Wilson. These names will always get me to watch something. I don't care what's in it. I don't care what it is. I will watch it. Are you ready to talk about some books? So there are um, titles that will probably be the first to come to mind when it comes to horror westerns. Um, the most prominent of which is probably going to be The Gunslinger specifically, but uh, the Stephen King's Dark Tower series. Um, if you if you Google horror Western novels, that is going to be the first 15 responses you're going to get. Um, with good reason. The Gunslinger is actually a really well done novel. Um, it's got one of the best opening lines in a novel. It's like people use the opening line to the Gunslinger to like teach courses on how to start a novel. So we'd be remiss to at least not give a nod to that series before we talk about our recommendations. One of my picks is a repeat pick from a previous episode, and I was torn between using it again or mentioning Josh Mallerman's Unburied Carol. And I went with my pick because I think Unburied Carol is a little more of like a almost a Western fairy tale retelling because it's kind of a Sleeping Beauty retelling in a way. So it, it wasn't quite as much horror as I would like. So I'm sneaking that in there as like, you could still read it if you're into like that Western weird West mashup genre. Right. And th that's probably another reason why I didn't necessarily want to put uh, the Dark Tower as a pick either, because the more you get into the series, the more it becomes a dark fantasy, more so than a horror Western. But they are still notable, notable books that if you are curious about the genre, they are worth picking up. 
for sure. So the first book I'm talking about today is Little Heaven by Nick Cutter. Yay for Canadian content. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nick Cutter. That's right. true. I forgot about that. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I'm Canadian. It is, it's federal law that I need to point that out at this point. In time. <laughs> He's Canadian, you know. Yes, is that I. offensive to you? <laughs> you heard the episode where I talked about my, I had a roommate my sophomore year in college or my junior year who was Canadian and she uh, basically educated me on every pop culture icon that is also Canadian ever. I do remember this. So my pick is Little Heaven by Nick Cutter, who, yes, is Canadian. And this is uh, a little more of a modern story. We are dealing with two timelines, but they are both modern day ones. And this follows a band of three mismatched mercenaries tasked with bringing back a woman's nephew who has been taken against his will to a backwoods settlement called Little Heaven in the hinterlands of New Mexico. So this group of mercenaries infiltrates the religious settlement and tries to extract the boy, but there's some problems because of the church and within the church and the settlement children have been going missing they've been hearing things in the surrounding wilderness so this book not only deals with the craziness around religious cults but also maybe some supernatural entities i will say this book is very different from the other nick cutter books um, like i said it's playing with some interesting supernatural elements along with some nods to some well-known things in history I really enjoyed this book. I think this might have actually been my first Nick Cutter book that I ever read. I remember when this one came out. That was around the time I first started getting into BookTube. And this one was making the rounds at the time. I think it's the first Nick Cutter book I've heard of. Interesting. But I didn't actually get to read it. I love the the three main mercenary characters. I love their whole thing. Their they're back and forth. They're all kind of badass in different ways. And I feel like I remember so much about this book and I can even remember just specific scenes of things that happen. Um, as for where I would rate this, I would put this in the fridge. The first half of the book is a little more atmospheric, but you really get to know everyone and there may not be like a curse at play. It's, I don't know, it's very interesting. Like I said, very different <laughs> from the troop and the deep. Uh, but in the first half, you get to know the mercenaries as characters and as people. He does a really good job of fleshing them out and you get to see, you know, what kind of baggage they're bringing to this job. And then in the second half, things get crazy. Sounds like a barrel of laughs and like, <laughs> for everyone involved. I don't know that I would describe it that way, but sure. <laughs> So that was Little Heaven by Nick Cutter. And now that's going to bring me to my first pick, which is going to be the first time that I have recommended this author, but he's no stranger to the podcast. Um, this is Jonathan Jans, and the novel is Dust Devils. So this is a straight up shoot 'em up kind of Western style horror. Um, it follows the main character of Cody, who um, gets paired up by circumstance with a young boy named Willet, and they are on the hunt for this trope of actors. The twist is that these actors are actually vampires. <gasps> what? Yeah. Um, the story, it opens up with basically the vampire's essentially devouring and destroying the young Willett's family and Cody kind of rescues him more or less. Um, but it goes back and forth between the present with Cody and Willett, like hunting them and the, like the, the events leading up to it where they recruit Cody's wife to be a part of the show for a couple of shows. And then they end up murdering her. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it keeps flashing back and forth from the things that led Cody to his, kind of like Ahab style vendetta versus the chase with the vampires. The action is done really well. Um, it opens up with such like energy. And then even in the, the, the calmer moments, you can still see like this book has made me a fairly big fan of, of just Jonathan Jans's writing. Um, I feel foolish to have not gotten to any of his work until this point. Um, especially with the high praise coming from Steph pretty much daily on how great Jonathan Chance is as a writer. But um but yeah, it's this one reminded me a lot of John Carpenter's Vampires. 
um, if we want to compare it to a movie. Uh, and honestly, that's a movie that we probably could have mentioned earlier in the episode when we talked about horror westerns in film. Um, it's very similar feel, very similar atmosphere, um, even very similar antagonist, I guess. But the vampires are charismatic. Cody is act- is a fairly likable hero. Um, yeah, it's it's all around just good. It's a little more more action than scare, which is kind of my trepidation going into the genre in the beginning. Uh, is that I think that this tends to lead itself more towards action than scary. So I will have to say it's probably a a a, a room temperature read. Um, in terms of scare, but in terms of just ability within the genre and storytelling, it's it's definitely an above average read. So I would definitely recommend it for anybody. Ooh, so you've read Jonathan Jans now. I have now read Jonathan Jans, yes. And he does good work. Very good work. Okay. It's just an, it's an interesting one to start with, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, this is one you haven't t- talked to me about. Yeah, that's one I haven't read actually. I just bought I bought a copy because a uh, Flame Tree Press had like a July Fourth sale, so this is one I picked up there. So you've read one that I haven't read. Ooh, I'm ahead of the game. But yeah, that was Dust Devils by Jonathan Jan. My next pick is The Hunger by Amakatsu, and this follows the events of the. Donner Party. And I don't know if we've had this conversation, but Rachel didn't have a lot of familiarity with what the Donner Party was because she said she was Canadian. So I don't know if you have more of like a pop culture understanding of the Donner Party. Um, Yes, I am familiar with it. Donner Party is uh, fodder for a decent amount of video games that I played too. So yeah, I'm familiar with it. I did not know that. Okay, so for those of you who do not know the Donner Party, there was a real event that happened in 1846. There was a group, like a big you know, caravan headed to California. And it was a group led by George Donner and James Reed. Unfortunately, that group hit some delays. They were stranded in the Sierra Mountains during an early and harsh winter where they faced some horrible circumstances and I think probably the biggest thing that people know about it probably culturally is that um, people in the group did resort to cannibalism to survive Mm -hmm. though I will say I have read uh, nonfiction books on this and it was like one group that was going ahead to try to Uh, trek through the mountains to get all the way to California to get help that that happened with and you know they only like eight people that had died they didn't like kill people I don't know if that makes it any more palatable to people (laughs) (laughs) but they only ate those who had died and fun fact more women survived in the Donner Party than men uh, because I think I mentioned this the episode where I talked about it but like a women's a female like core body temperature is lower and they have a usually a slower metabolism so it it takes longer for them to starve to death (laughs) and to die of hypothermia so yeah yes (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) something to be proud of (laughs) um but anyway in the hunger (laughs) by Katsu, she uh, takes this story and uh you know, writes a fictional account. So she she takes the people that were there and weaves a, a fictional narrative through these stories. You do get to know who these characters are. I really enjoyed that she played with um, style. Like some of the chapters open up with diary entries and letters. There's a lot of atmosphere in this book. This book has a very strong sense of setting. And I think I talked about this... <sighs> I mean, it might have been the winter episode, but, you know, this also has that survival horror trope I like, which is, you know, a group of people are, you know, out facing the elements and slowly but surely start to turn on each other and lose trust on e- lose trust in each other. And we see that a little bit here. Um, people start pointing their fingers at George's wife, Tamsin, who they're accusing to be a witch. And a lot of stuff happens. You know, people, children are disappearing from the group and people aren't sure what's happening. So this is the Donner Party story with a supernatural element thrown in and obviously like a, a fictionalized version of what happened. I will say this is a slower story. I would put at least the first half of it 
in the room temperature range because it is it's setting up everything that's going to happen. Um, I would not say this is like a fast pace, can't put down type of story. So like I said, room temperature, great for people who love atmosphere and character stories with a sense of dread brewing in the background. So that is The Hunger by Almakatsu. Slow burns. It's totally terrifying. Yeah. It doesn't sound like this one was, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my last pick for this week is an indie published title by the author uh, Scott Langrell. And this is a book called Drovers and Demons. It's a weird tale of the Old West and subtitled Murphy and Loco, book one. So this is the first book in a series, although there is only one title available at the, this point in time. And this one is a little more horror, I think, than Western. Murphy is a hired gun. Uh, Loco is an Apache. And if you know, and again, if you see a bunch of Westerns, you know the, the, the trope of, of the cowboys and indian kind of thing um so a little bit of a twist on that on that stereotype though loco is actually incredibly educated he's a very articulate very well-spoken and smart character just want to make sure i preface that you have murphy who just got hired on as uh like a security for this mine and a pe- and loco is uh a worker within the mine and they uncover um this like hidden cavern in there and it essentially is the former final resting place of this uh, other tribe called the Anasazi. And they end up being kind of released. Um, they're an ancient, like, bloodthirsty kind of tribe that had their souls kind of uh, imprisoned within this mine. And now they're, um, now they're free. And it's basically up to Murphy and Loco to deal with this this problem before they bring about more or less the end of the world. So yeah, uh, this kind of flies in the face of what I mentioned earlier about how Western generally have lower, uh, smaller scope, um, and horror westerns are kind of you know small scale, non world ending calamities. But this one, as I said, it's, it feels like it's more horror than western, but um, it it certainly takes that story and puts it in the setting flawlessly. Um, the writing I found really really well done. Um, I don't like using you know in saying that you wouldn't tell it's indie published as as a compliment because it implies that indie publishing is not up to par. But I'm going to say it anyway right now because reading this it doesn't feel like it's like it's a self published book. It is indeed um, Scott has a flair for writing him scott has a flair for writing the idea of a hired gun a cowboy and an indian going up against what's essentially um an army of spirits slash creature things um trying to prevent what will eventually be hell on earth that is it's just an all-around good time as far as i'm concerned I'd rather enjoy it. It sounds like Western Good Omens kind of thing. Kind of, yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's weird. It's it's such a non-Western story, but done really well within a Western setting. Um, so this would totally fit within the the Weird West niche. Um, and yeah, like I said, it it was just a fun story to read. Temperature wise, um, it is certainly. Uh, I would say colder than Dust Devils. Um, however, once again, it falls into the whole. There's more action here than horror. There's definitely eerie scenes, like people that are not really themselves, but they are of they are the Anasazi and stuff. It, it you can get kind of like a body snatchers kind of vibe from it. And there's parts that probably are a little eerie, and just the situation itself is kind of dire. But again, not so much to to justify i think putting it in the fridge so if there was a scale of room temperature ratings i could give i would probably give it the coldest room temperature i could give it but it's still a room temperature read you're gonna need to create like a micro scale (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i am longing for the day that i can sit here and say this book is going in the freezer because it is going to shock the world when that happens but yeah, um, so that was Drovers and Demons, A Weird Tale of the Old West by Scott Langrell. 
So I'm excited for my last pick because it's one I teased earlier. It is one of my favorite mixes in horror. Oh, crap. I'm a horrible person for not remembering that because I remember you saying this. So my next pick, (laughs) my last pick is In the Valley of the Sun by Andy Davidson. Vampires. (laughs) Yes. Um. So it was really hard because the synopsis dances around the fact. So I wasn't sure how much to say about it. But then I looked at the cover for the paper bag and it's a skull with a cowboy hat and it, it has the vampire things. So I'm like, okay, I feel like they're not hiding it. That <laughs> they're much. not being subtle about that aspect of it. <laughs> so I feel like it's not much of a spoiler to be like, this is about vampires. <laughs> Because, yeah, like I was reading the synopsis and it's like, you know, he meets someone and something happens to him and now he's acting differently. I'm like, all right, so it's like dancing around it. But weirdly, the paperback cover is not. So the main character in this is Travis Stilwell, who spends his nights searching out women in West Texas honky tonks. And what he does doesn't make him proud, just quiets his demons for a little while. But his nights soon take a terrifying turn in a desert cantina where Travis crosses paths with a mysterious pale-skinned girl in red boots. Come the morning, he wakes weak and bloodied in his cab over camper with no sign of a girl and no memory of the night before. I've had nights like that. <laughs> oh my gosh, did you wake up as a vampire? Uh, we can't talk about that. This is why you only work nights. We no, can't talk of- about that. <laughs> a lot of things are making sense now. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Travis is the main character. We also follow um, We also follow a woman named Annabelle who owns a motel and sees Travis and offers him some work and he starts insinuating himself into her life and the life of her 10 year old son. But, you know, they start to realize that uh, he's a little strange and not quite what he seems. And another storyline that we're following, which was my favorite and I wanted more of is the Texas Ranger that's hunting Travis down for his past misdeeds. And I don't know, it had a real like true detective vibe to it, like a dusty Texas, like sheriff hunting down someone. I just really liked it. I wanted more of that. But I did get a lot of vampire stuff, so it was fine. It was a good mix. <laughs> like, I think the last line on this is like, yeah, he's hunting Travis down for his past misdeeds. But what he finds will lead him to a revelation far more monstrous than he could ever imagine. A man of the law, he'll have to decide how far into the darkness he'll go. For the sake of justice. When these lives converge on a dusty autumn night, an old evil will find new life and new blood. My gosh, should I narrate movie trailers? (laughs) (laughs) This book takes place in modern times. It's a very Texas story. And what I love about this is that there's a lot of morally gray characters. Travis is 100% an anti-hero. When we meet him, he is a bad guy. I don't know if you got that from the synopsis. He was doing <laughs> bad things <laughs> yeah. yeah, before he gets turned. And so you are reading a lot of the book is from his perspective. And I really loved that. Um, I thought that was just something that was done really well. Um, and... I don't know what it is about vampires and Westerns that I think just goes together so well. Maybe it's like two things that have a certain kind of romanticism about them, but I think they just pair up very well when they're, when they're done together. Um, This was a great story. I loved all of the storylines, you know, like I loved the, the detective Texas Ranger that's hunting him. I loved, you know, Travis dealing with this thing. I loved like the woman and her son, who meet Travis and let him into their lives. I just thought they, it was very well done. They all came together. I picked this up, I think like a year ago because it was nominated for the Bram Stoker First Novel Award. And I read this with Sean over at Eclectic Reads because he's also like a really big fan of vampire stories. But I think he also just does like the whole, he always reads the nominees for the First Novel Award. I was going to say, doesn't he have uh, like a, not a challenger, but he has some kind of thing he wants to read a bunch of award winners or? Yeah. This one didn't end up winning. I think, um, what one? I think it was like Cold Cuts. That was like a crazy year. Like this was nominated and Kill Creek was nominated. They, yeah, they both lost. That was a strong year. (laughs) 
This is one that I, I was going to pick up until I saw you already had it wrote down as your pick for the episode coming up. Sorry. <laughs> so I end up reading other stuff. Yeah, it's very good. If you ever get a chance to pick it up, I would definitely recommend it. But yeah, ugh, just if you love a morally gray characters and like a dusty Texas setting, um, I would totally suggest this. And Andy Davidson has a new book coming out. I think I've seen like an arc floating around. I think it's called The Boatman's Daughter. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I will definitely be picking it up after loving this one so much. Um, I would put this in the fridge. This is a strong character novel. We spent a lot of time getting to know all these people, but there's still some gruesome scenes. Some of them are more after the fact. Um, we do get to know the, you know, pale skinned woman that Travis met at the bar. We get to know her story. That's pretty, pretty crazy and out there. And yeah, I would say this is between room temperature and fridge. One of Devin's weird in between room temperature and fridge ratings. Aha, it's growing. <laughs> um, that is In the Valley of the Sun by Andy Davidson. So I actually haven't been watching a ton of horror recently. <sighs> I know, guys, I'm so sorry. I did go see Midsummer, but confession time i didn't love it as much as hereditary Ooh, bold words i know i'm sorry and it's funny because a lot of people that i follow say they like it more than hereditary so you know what to each his own um i still enjoyed it but i didn't love it i don't know what to say to you right now i know i don't know who i am <laughs> no i legit don't know because i haven't seen it yet <laughs> but for something dark that i've been enjoying recently uh catching up on barry season two I think this was a chilling obsession I did last year. I did season one last year as a chilling obsession. Uh, but this follows a Bill Hader, who is a hitman on a job in Los Angeles. And one of his marks is in a acting class. And so he goes to that, like sits in on the acting class to stalk him. But he ends up falling in love with acting and he decides he wants to be an actor and stay in LA. So the show is him trying to balance out those two things. We pick up on season two. All of the misdeeds that happened in season one are coming back to find him but he's also becoming more involved in acting and wants to like direct a play just all of these things about his two worlds colliding no ho hank i think is one of my favorite characters of all time i just he's my favorite and i don't know it just does such a great job of balancing really funny moments with really dark moments very well which i love see i've been watching a lot of comedies so this is probably the darkest comedy i seen in a long also currently nominated for an emmy for season two definitely check it out it's on hbo it's barry okay um so for the complete opposite of that my chilling obsession is so horrible it's entertaining and i love it um i watched a movie called gallo walkers not familiar with it well i don't think many people are um i, I didn't know this existed until doing research for this episode uh, apparently this movie came out in 2012 uh, it stars Wesley Snipes in the main role. Um, and this is about Wesley Snipes' character. He got vengeance on the men who assaulted and impregnated the love of his life, who ended up eventually dying, and he got revenge and killed them. But then they came back to life. Oh. The premise of the movie is that like, it's him trying to hunt them back down and, and kind of kill them for good. All the while, they seem to be hunting him as well because when when he killed all the the men he also killed the son of like the leader and although the men came back and his woman came back and he came back his son didn't so it's this weird double revenge kind of story of just sheer insanity the acting wesley snipes is a good actor i like wesley snipes but the acting in this movie was absolutely so bad it was hilarious and the premise was great like now don't get me wrong it is kind of there's there's gory parts there's parts where you see the main character who like he doesn't have any skin on his upper torso whatsoever and he like peels it off of another guy so like it, it's gross and it's definitively horror but it's one of those so bad it's good movies and wesley snipes playing this so deadpan and serious in such a weird movie oh it needs to be experienced <laughs> It has to. Wait, so does this like take place in like Western times? 
Um, yes. Uh, I don't think it actually ever really tells like the time frame, the setting, like specifically, but it is. It's men on horseback with six shooters, you know, sheriffs, the gallows. There's you see people get hung. Like it's it's straight up frontier time kind of western setting. Um, for all this to be taking place and. Oh, it's just the sheer lunacy of what I experienced watching this movie just has to be shared. So, yeah, that was Gala Walkers. Okay, but weird, like, double W capitalization? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is. But, yeah, the two W's are capitalized in Gala Walkers. And it's one word? It's one word. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> We're into the first week of August, which means we are in a new book for Books in the Freezer Book Club. Yeah, so if you listened to the last episode, we picked The Switch House by Tim Meyer. It's a novella. It should be available on Amazon. You can get a physical copy. Of course, it's available on Kindle. Actually, it's available on Kindle Unlimited. And this time, there is an audiobook for it. (laughs) Hallelujah. And as usual, we have our live stream for Patreon supporters for, I think it's Axe Wielding Maniacs and Malevolent Spirits. We do a YouTube live stream for Patreon supporters over the book, just kind of have a book club discussion. And that's on the last Sunday of the month. Right. Which is the 25th. This uh-huh. week. So that'll be at like 7.30 Eastern Standard Time for Patreon supporters. And we did get some requests for this, guys. So we are doing it. We are going to do a Stephen King episode. But it's going to be a little different. Because Devin and I are not Stephen King experts. <laughs> well, well, I mean, Seth. I mean, okay. You know, I, I, I will speak for myself. I am not a Stephen <laughs> King expert. If Devin wants to claim that and have all the Stephen <laughs> King fandom come after him, I will step by. <laughs> I will step aside and let it happen. Um, I am not a Stephen King expert. Um, let's move on. <clears throat> <laughs> when it comes to Stephen King, we're both familiar with a lot more stuff than we've actually read. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel, or sorry, so we don't feel like it'd be, it would do it justice for us to do like a straight up just episode where we recommend a Stephen King book to you guys. So what we're planning on working on now is kind of making this episode uh, a viewer's choice kind of episode where what we'll do, we'll do a countdown of the top 10 favorite Stephen King novels as voted by the listeners of Books in the Freezer. We will put up a thread on our Goodreads group. You guys can talk about what your favorite Stephen King book is there. I will also ask on our Instagram and Instagram stories, and you guys can submit your answers. But what we are looking for, if you would like to be included in the episode, you can email us a recording of yourself telling us what your favorite Stephen King book is and why. We just ask that the recordings be no more than 30 seconds. And so we would love, I think like our idea would be like, you know, to do the top 10 countdown and include, you know, actual audio input from listeners telling us like why they like that book. And if your book isn't in the top 10, you know, we might be able to do it at the top on like an honorable mentions. And yeah, so that's that's essentially what the plan is to make it a more um, listener interactive kind of uh, episode. We'll we'll read some comments from the Goodreads and from the Instagram. Uh, we'll play the audio clips if you guys send it in, um, and we will also share probably a recommendation or two of our own of just Stephen King books that we've enjoyed, just with the caveat that it's not based upon a wealth of knowledge of other Stephen King titles because again, it's such a huge library that I haven't read. Um, so I wouldn't be comfortable kind of ascertaining myself to be an expert in that field. It's just crazy. He's just written so much stuff because I've read like 11 of his books and I feel like any other author, I would be an expert. <laughs> yeah. But he's written like 60 something books. So that is nothing. <laughs> I've read enough that I feel like I can be in the conversation about it, but yeah. I would not want to be the authority on the situation. Yeah, no, God, no. Like I said, we want to give you guys plenty of time to get your get your voices heard and get your your messages in so this is something we're going to work on consistently between now and and probably end up compiling it for maybe uh, a special episode we post in october probably maybe close to halloween as a special treat for the uh, books in the freezer listeners so please send us those clips and we'd love to hear what you think we got a new review on apple podcasts yay <laughs> It's a five-star review. It's titled Awesome Podcast by Callie P. She says, absolutely love this podcast. I have always been curious about the horror genre, but I'm a bit of a chicken. Listening to this has been the best way to dip my toes in, and I love the rating system. It has been such a great help in knowing which books I can handle and which books I might need to wait on. 
Although I'm a bit afraid to find out what book Devin would actually put in the freezer. LOL. I love listening and look forward to each new episode. Keep up the great work. <laughs> I'm very curious to that too, Callie. Very curious. Nothing shakes him. Nothing stirs it. <laughs> nothing Nothing shakes Devin. <laughs> Yet. But when it happens, oh man. We will all be shook. But thanks for that review, for sure. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for your kind words. And thank you everyone who's taken the time to write a review on Apple Podcasts. It really means a lot to us. You know, we do read them, as you can see. So just thank you. All of you have had nothing but nice things to say on there. So again, I guess again, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Books in the Freezer is a bi-weekly podcast. We post episodes every other Tuesday. You can find us on Twitter at Books Freezer Pod or on Instagram at Books in the Freezer. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash books in the freezer. You can send us an email at books in the freezer at gmail.com. And that's where you can send those voice clips to. Show notes for this episode and all previous episodes are at booksinthefreezer.com. I'm Stephanie. You can find me on Twitter at Lady underscore Ganya. That's L-A-D-Y underscore G-A-G-N-O-N. Or on Instagram at That's What She Read. That's with two A's. You can find me on YouTube at That's What She Read. That one's just spelled the normal way. And I'm Devin. You can find me on Twitter at Insomni Reads. And I stream on Twitch as the Indie Insomniac. Join us next time for Books in the Freezer. (laughs) 